Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello, and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we interview experts from around the world on subjects such as leadership, diversity, communication, and and anything you need to really be visible. My guest today is Dr. Amy Clymer, who speaks about creativity and how you can do innovation on demand. Uh, but before I go on to the, all the details about Amy and how awesome she is, I'd like to invite you to see how your presentation skills are doing <clears throat> by taking our free four-minute assessment. If you go to speakforresultsquiz.com, that's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. You could take a free four minute assessment that will show you where your presentation skills are strong and where perhaps a little bit of support could get you the results you need and the recognition that you deserve. If you score high enough, you'll be entitled to a free 45 minute conversation with me to discuss those results and talk about how you can really use them. Amy Clymer and I had a really interesting conversation about creativity. Of course, I've spent many years in the arts, so creativity was always something I had to work on, and I've, I've been stuck. So I wanted to ask her, what do you do on days when the muse is not sitting on your shoulder, whispering in your ear? How can you be innovative on demand? She's some very useful things for teams, some tools we can use, and really interesting ideas. The official bio is Dr. Amy Clymer teaches teams to be creative and innovative. She's a speaker, trainer, and coach in creativity, innovation, and team development. She uses research-based practices, tools, and techniques to teach teams how to innovate on demand. Uh, Amy holds a PhD in leadership and change from Antioch University. She's trained in certified and, and certified in creative problem solving, immunity to change, and the foresight thinking system. She developed the deliberate creative teams scale to help teams understand how to increase their creativity. Amy is the designer of Climber Cards, a creative creativity and team building tool used by thousands to deepen team conversations and generate ideas. In 2016, she won the Carl Ronke Creativity Award from the Association for Experimental Education. Amy Clymer had was a really interesting guest. We had a really fun conversation. I think you'll enjoy it. On to the conversation. Amy Clymer, I am so happy to have you on Speakers Who Get Results. Welcome. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. I'm so happy to be here. Well, you know, when I, a friend, a mutual friend told me about you and I went to your website and I went, oh my God, why didn't I know her? Why haven't I known you for years? <laughs> it's, there's, you're definitely something, what we do is so complimentary and hopefully you can help me answer some of those questions that, um, that plague me as a creative person. Well, I look but, forward to our conversation. I'm excited. Yeah. Before we start, I'd like to ask you about your dream interview. If you could interview someone who's no longer with us, who would it be? What would you ask them? And who should be listening? <laughs> 
So the person that I would want to interview is Sir Ernest Shackleton, who was an Arctic explorer over 100 years ago. And he was attempting to cross Antarctica on foot. At that point, nobody had done it yet. And um, his boat sunk. Mm -hmm. And what was amazing at the time is not only did his boat sink, I mean, you would expect that everybody perished, but instead he got every single person out. There are 28 men, including him, and he was able to get them all back to safety. It was a phenomenal story of leadership. And he was a pretty unique leader for his time. Very, um, really kind of more modern day philosophies. Mm -hmm. So I think the question I would want, the questions I would want to ask him, um, you know, since his death, um, which was a few years after that incident, you know, people have studied him and looked back, but I would want to ask him questions about his leadership as far as like, what motivated him? Why did he, like, how did this different approach the, the today doesn't seem that different, but back then was like, it was expected that if you were on an, an uh, Arctic or Antarctic expedition, that there was a very high likelihood you were going to die. And leaders kind of expected like, yeah, somebody in this group's going to die. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not taking that approach. And he did all these things that um, he really developed like this sense of deep community amongst mm-hmm. the team in a way that other leaders at the time, at least Arctic leaders, weren't considering. They didn't understand that like the, the behavior amongst the group was going to impact the group's success. Uh-huh. And so I would want to ask him questions about that. Like, how did that evolve for you? And why did you feel like that was important? Um, wow. I'll stop that's, there because I could go on and on. <laughs> that's very cool. Well, that that actually leads us leads me into the sorts of things I wanted to talk to you. We are recording this for Pride Month in 2022. Um, you and I were both talking about how um, we both identify as LGBTQ, which is lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer. And all the various, all the all the flavors along the spectrum. Yes. Yet it's not the main thing of what we do. Yeah. That's that's a private life, but in our public lives, we are business people and trainers and coaches. Uh, I'm curious how you decided to make creativity your thing. Hmm. Yeah. So let me just give some context first and say that what I do now is I teach teams and organizations how to be more creative, how to be more innovative. And I can remember being pretty young, um, definitely middle school, high school, maybe even younger than that, and being very curious about the concept of creativity. I don't know if I maybe even understood it fully, you know, in elementary school, but definitely by high school, when I heard friends of mine say, oh gosh, I'm not creative at all. I can barely draw. And I would get really frustrated. I was like, what? No, it's not about drawing. And I would, you know, it's, it's way more than that. And I don't know where I got these ideas from necessarily. Um, cause I was also very into art. So I was mm-hmm. into that side of creativity and then probably around 98, um, I stumbled across the book, the artist's way, which had only been uh, out at that time for two yes. years. And that was really insightful to help me understand the concepts of creativity more. And I started teaching it just like these free classes. I was in grad school at the time and I would just literally like put up flyers and teach these classes and get people together. And eventually fast forward a number of years, um, I ended up studying it as part of my PhD dissertation. And I I also, meanwhile, was very interested in teams. And so for my dissertation, I looked at creativity in teams, which we can get more into if you want. But um, that was, yeah, I don't know. I've, I've always been very curious about creativity, even from when I was pretty young. That's that's wonderful. Having spent 30 years in the opera business, you are you are creative within a format. Yes. You know, if you, I mean, the, you're working with material, most of the time you're working with material that's been around for a couple hundred years. And the creativity is how do you put your stamp onto it? Uh, I am curious. One of the things that you talk about is, you know, finding uh, how you find 
what you're going to be creative about, how you find topics, how do you get your ideas? Uh, Because so much of what I do, of course, is helping people speak about ideas Mm. so that it will raise their profile. And I know you talk about this at what, so um, I want to pick your brain. I'm going to take notes. (laughs) Tell me, what do you, when you talk about, how do you find these ideas? Yeah, that's a great question. So thinking specifically about people who are trying to become either professional speakers, or maybe they just need to speak as part of their jobs, like, you know, their CEOs or C-suite or whatever their role is, which actually, yeah, yeah, and actually... I think a lot, like most people who are professionals who have like a professional job at some point in their career, they will be asked to stand up and speak and talk about blah, 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 whatever they're good at. Mm -hmm. And I think one way to think about what are those ideas? What are those topics that you might talk about is to think about when are those occasions when people reach out to you and say, oh, hey, Elizabeth, look, could I just take you out to coffee and pick your brain about something? And you're sometimes, for me anyway, sometimes the response is to my, in my head internally, I'm thinking, oh, sure. I didn't even think of myself as being good at that. Mm -hmm. And I realized that other people are seeing something in me that I'm not seeing. And that's Mm -hmm. a real sign that oh, okay, this is, you know, other people are onto something, pay attention to that. Because sometimes it's the things that come really easy to us yeah. that we don't, it doesn't even occur to us that someone else might not understand or might not know. And mm-hmm. that can be a really helpful place to move that thought leadership in, you know, in that direction. Oh, I, I love that. Um, how do we, how can we, uh, within teams, be more creative? And, and really, where does that play in um, the teams and leaders? Or how does that work together? And mm-hmm. uh, you know, people talk about innovation all the time. Yes. How do you find the new thing? Uh, yeah, so how, let me, how, can, how can you do that? How? Yeah, so let me talk a little bit about the, we'll talk about the teams first, and then we can look at leaders for a moment. But So in the dissertation research that I did a few years ago, I was very curious about this question and I had had experiences and Elizabeth, you probably have had these two, probably many people listening where I'd been a part of some teams that I felt really creative and collectively we were highly creative. And then I'd been a part of other teams where I felt like when I just sat down at a meeting, it was like all my creativity drained out. Mm -hmm. And I felt that individually I was less creative and collectively we were. And I was very curious, like, what is the difference between these two teams? What's going on here? And so I was able to identify three elements that teams need if they want to be creative together. And I call this the deliberate creative teams model, because first of all, I am a huge proponent of this concept of deliberate creativity, that Mm -hmm. creativity will not happen by accident. I could pretty much guarantee you. And when you hear those, those incidences where you think like, oh, they just randomly had this idea. Mm, If you actually dig back, it's not that random or accidental. It's Mm -hmm. much more deliberate. So anyway, so I created this model and there's three elements that teams need. The first element is the team needs to have a shared team purpose. Like Mm -hmm. what is our purpose as a team? Why do we get together? Most teams are pretty good at that, but I have actually been working. I have worked with teams before where they could not answer the question of what their team purpose was. It just never occurred to them to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's the first thing is they need to have a clear team purpose. The second thing is they need to have strong team dynamics, meaning Mm -hmm. they need to, you know, communicate well, they need to be able to engage in some conflict. They don't want to avoid conflict completely, but you also don't want to always be in conflict. So there's a nice Mm -hmm. happy medium there. And, um, and they need to be able to trust each other at least Mm. enough where I trust that if I put an idea out on the table, I'm not going to get smacked down for that. Right. And I can be vulnerable enough to share an idea, even if I'm worried that it might be a little silly or stupid Mm -hmm. and my team's going to, you know, embrace me for that or embrace the idea, at least for a minute. That doesn't mean you're going to take the idea, but you know, I'm not going to get, uh, you know, made fun of or whatever. So, uh, team purpose, team dynamics. And then the third element is called team creative process. Mm. 
And that is where the team needs to know and use what is the process for how they're going to be creative together. And this is the area that most teams struggle with because most teams don't even know that there's a process. Um, And there's many out there you can use. Um, The one that I teach the most is called creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. There's also design thinking, human-centered design, um, some that are less popular today, synaptics, Triz. Like there's so many processes out there. They're all very, very similar. And it could even be something that you come up with internally. But the point is that everyone on the team knows it and you're collectively using it. Um, I know that we have some people listening or watching via video. So this is a Venn diagram uh, uh, just of the model, just showing the Mm -hmm. the three elements, team purpose, team dynamics, and team creative process. It's just in a simple Venn diagram. So that's like the big picture of how teams can be creative together. And then, you know, of course we can dig in a little deeper if if we want. Um, But I also want to pause there and, and jump over to leadership before I do Anything well, I look, the whole thought that there is a process. I was just telling somebody earlier today about oh, when I was learning the art of public speaking and speaking to get a result. Uh, I was raising money for my nonprofit to to start to launch my nonprofit, and I learned from a public speaker trainer who called me up after seeing me absolutely do a disastrous fundraiser, a disaster table where everybody walked out with their credit cards still in their pockets. And she called me up and she said, you know, there are tools and techniques that you can use. Absolutely. I was so happy to discover that, oh, I didn't have to figure this out. You mean there are, there are tools there. I could do this. Someone could teach me how to do this. Ah, so I really is a relief. This, that that you've got a process. Yeah. And it really yeah. is a relief, right? Because you think like you have to come up with this all on your own. And it's like, no, no, just use this process and then use that creative energy for whatever it is you're trying to be creative on. Don't use it to come up with a process that's already been done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where do the leaders come in? Okay. So what I found in my research is, um, I guess I want to say good news and bad news for leaders, but that's not quite fair. Basically the Let me start off by saying the most important factor of a team's success around innovation is those, all those three elements I talked about, which is really about within the team. Mm -hmm. The leader's job becomes being able to support the team around their, you know, developing their, their creative skills uh, to guide them and sometimes to actually provide that process. Mm -hmm. And it also, you know, it can vary a little bit, like, is the leader also a team member or are they a leader that's like overseeing the team, but isn't necessarily involved in the day-to-day work mm-hmm. of the team. But I think mostly it's supporting, guiding, creating like a culture. Um, I, I almost hesitate to say rewarding, but yes, rewarding. Um, re- rewarding has a whole complication to it of, you know, do we, that it can actually can kind of backfire at times, but you want to make it clear, like we care about you all being creative, which mm-hmm. also means you got to be okay with some failure at times Mm -hmm. because creativity is about going into the unknown. It's about taking risks. And so if you only want your team to succeed, if you're only okay with them succeeding, they're not going to be creative because that's just too risky for them. Like, so they're, they need to know that uh, if we totally mess up, it's going to be okay. Say that again about being okay with failure. I think that's important. Yeah. So if you think about it, like creativity is you're doing something that hasn't been done. At least it hasn't been done in this particular context that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so there is a a possibility that it's not going to work. And, you know, there's all these ways you can kind of mitigate that. You can do some testing and prototyping and, you know, starting small, which are all really good ideas. That's, those are good approaches, but still it could be that you, you know, put a bunch of time, maybe, you know, a month, maybe a year into something and it doesn't work. And so what's the leader's response going to be? And Mm -hmm. if its response is, yeah, thanks. We don't need you part of our team anymore. We don't need you part of our organization. If there's like a fear of repercussion, the team's not going to be creative. Like, oh, mm -mm, I I need the safety and security of my job or play safe. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, So the leader plays a really big role in that. 
That, I, I love that. Um, being okay with failure. Uh, the, so here's the other question. One of the things that you have these, this wonderful tool called the climber cards. And I'm wondering if this is the answer to the next question, which is if you have to innovate on demand, uh, the, the, and this makes me think of years ago, the the blues singer Loudon Wainwright III wrote a song called the No Muse Blues, where he says, you know, I'm sitting here, muse, where are you? I'm sitting here, I can't think. And boy, I have sure spent those days where I have to write something. I'm, you know, I'm supposed to be writing a newsletter or I'm supposed to be writing a blog or a script. And that muse, she's off whispering into someone else's ear, which is just not inspiring me at all. Uh, help, if you have some way of like, bringing the muse back to come talk to you, I want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. And I mean, Elizabeth, you're not alone. We have all been there. We've all been stuck. And there, so in, in the creative problem solving process, there's, a, there's four stages and there's a number of techniques for each of the stages. And so one of the helpful things can be just try a new technique. So that's where, so I developed this deck of cards. They're called climber cards. Um, for those of you watching on video, I'm just going to hold up um, the mm -hmm. deck here. And basically what they are, they look, they're the size of playing cards. There's 52 in the deck, but the images are just all these little hand-drawn kind of iconic, they're paintings that I actually drew. And so there's a telephone and a tent and a puzzle piece. And so for those of you who are listening. Yeah, yeah, cactus, butterfly, window, just these really simple images, very familiar images. Mm -hmm. And what can be, there's this concept uh, in creativity called associations where mm -hmm. um, we might, you know, say, for instance, look at the cactus and think about like, okay, well, what are some qualities of a cactus? You know, they're prickly, they thrive in the sun, they don't need much water, they and from there, you might make some associations to whatever problem or challenge you're looking at, and that might spur some more ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I do when I'm working with my clients is whatever challenge we're looking at, we'll, we have, we'll usually craft a particular question. And then I'll tell them like, okay, we're going to put out these cards. If, if we're in person, we use the physical deck. And if we're virtual, uh, I have an app that I created. Then we put out the cards and it's, you know, what ideas do you get from these images? What mm -hmm. ideas are sparked from these images? And it's interesting because some people love the images. They're like, oh my gosh, this is super helpful. And some people actually don't as much. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, I, I, what I try to do is I always use several techniques, several ideation techniques, mm -hmm. because we all kind of respond to different things. Yes. And sometimes we need a different technique for a different type of problem. And so we mix it up. But anyway, mm -hmm. this is, uh, th that's in part how I use climber cards and, and how they evolved. Uh, that actually makes me think about the people who are um, visual learners, auditory learners, and kinesthetic learners. The great thing about the cards is it gives the kinesthetic learners something to do with their hands. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's helpful for the visual folks as well. Very helpful you know? for the visual ones. Yeah. I'm an auditory learner. Uh, so I used to, it, it took me a long time to figure out why people used flip charts and, and, um, and slide decks. <laughs> Cause it's it, awesome. And I, and I found, and I, until I finally realized, oh, that's for the visual learners. For me, I have to hear it and say it back. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do for the auditory learners? Well, um, we're whatever, like for instance, in this technique, so what happens? So let's say a group is working together, four or five people who are, you know, mm -hmm. huddled around a table working on this particular problem. There's also an auditory component to it. So mm -hmm. someone might say, oh yeah, I'm taking, I'm looking at that old fashioned telephone and that's making me think about blah, blah, blah. And then the auditory person might say, oh yeah. And that idea just sparked this for me. And mm -hmm. so part of the process is really about building on each other's ideas, combining about And a lot of it is through that conversation. Uh, I also try to really 
put all the ideas in writing as well, because uh -huh. the challenge with the auditory is that, you know, only the people present there could hear it. And yes. it's going to be impossible to remember everything because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, often we're getting dozens, if not hundreds of ideas in a pretty short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's that auditory piece as well. How do you ensure that everybody gets a turn? So I am not a big fan of the classic brainstorming approach. And so just to reiterate, if anyone's not familiar, you've probably done this, but the approach is basically, you know, everyone's, you know, maybe huddled around a table again and people are just shouting out ideas. They're just verbally sharing ideas. There's mm -hmm. no order or anything. They're just whatever comes to mind. And there's a number of problems with that approach. It does work in a few cases and we can get into that if you want. But the point is there are other techniques. And so almost always I start out and I invite people to take a little pad of post notes. Everybody gets a pad and just quietly write their ideas. One idea per post note, very basic, very simple. And pretty soon, you know, everybody has four or five, six ideas on in a little pile. Mm -hmm. And then I have them start sharing and they literally just go around in a circle and start sharing the ideas, at least initially. Um, or sometimes if, if there's a need to make it more anonymous, we'll just put them up on a wall and then people can go read them. But it, really democratizes the process a bit so mm -hmm. that the loudest voice doesn't always win. You know, like that's uh -huh. not, that's not necessarily the best way to be innovative because sometimes the quieter person is like thinking up this genius idea, you know? Um, so that's one way to make it more inclusive. It, tell us the story of how you've done this with a, with a cl uh, client, how this has worked with it. Say a client who's, uh, whose team was stuck. The department was stuck. Yeah. So um, one of my clients was a very large, well-known hospital, and mm -hmm. I worked with their IT department. And their IT department was going through some massive changes. They were, to be honest, a bit antiquated in their uh, technology, and they really needed to make some forward strides. And they were kind of stuck in the process. And so I worked with them... I guess it was over a period of a few months and mm -hmm. this was during the height of the pandemic. So we did this all virtually and taught them, taught them this team model, the deliberate creative team model, taught them the creative problem solving process. We used that process to look at some of the challenges they had. Um, also taught them some other tools where it wasn't just the team coming up with ideas, but they were also reaching out to other stakeholders from you know, the bottom all the way to the top of the organization so that mm -hmm. they could get some more input because it, depending on your, your challenge, what you're looking at, it can be very dangerous to not solicit input from you mm -hmm. know, different stakeholders, particularly those that are going to be affected by whatever you implement. Uh, and it's also a common mistake. Um, I think so. Very common mistake. <laughs> to not ask them, create something and not actually ask the people who are going to use it what they need. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it is funny because, you know, here we are talking about it. It seems so basic and simple, but, it, you know, it can it can definitely trip teams up. So, uh, yeah. And so over time, they they developed a lot of innovative ideas. I mean, it was, it was small, subtle stuff that was going to change their approach. Um, I mean, uh, I, I don't, to be honest, I don't remember all the nuances of mm -hmm. the specific ideas, but it helped them, uh, what they came up with helped them be more collaborative. And they had a lot of um, like processes that were kind of being duplicated or uh -huh. had become overly cumbersome over time. Like, oh, 10 people need to approve this. And it's like, okay, no, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were able to streamline things and, and make it cleaner and easier. How do you go from idea to implementation? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Um, this is a stage where personally, I, that's what I want to do personally. I have an idea and I want to just go. <laughs> and obviously that doesn't always work. So there is a, um, a, a, the, between idea and implementation, there's a stage called develop. And this is where you need, so let me back up and say, I am a big believer in the concept ideas are a dime a dozen. I feel like they're actually pretty worthless 
until you start doing something with them. If we had, you know, 10 entrepreneurs here who all were given the exact same idea and said, come back in two months with this idea developed and implemented, we're going to come back with 10 different approaches, 10 different things. So it's really is that development and how you implement it that's going to make a difference. So part of that developing the idea is looking at, do we even want to do this? Or what does mm-hmm. it actually mean? Because it might only be a sentence on a post-it note. And so really looking at, well, if we were to do this, what would happen? What are some potential impacts of this? Or what would this look like? What are the steps? How, where do we get started? Who needs to be involved? And so having those conversations and you know, figuring out all those details is really important. And there will be some people in your team or within your organization who will love doing that. That's their strength. Mm-hmm. And other people who they want to know why we're spending so much time talking on it, why we can't just get started. Mm-hmm. And so you really want to bring the people in that love developing into mm-hmm. this phase of the process. Yeah. It's actually makes me think about how we can support. If you know what part you're good at, make sure you have people on the team who are good at the parts you aren't good at. A hundred percent agree. Yes. And certainly one of the things that I've seen a lot, I'd be curious to your comments about this is someone say a leader at top gets really excited about a really cool idea. And then they don't want to hear from the other people who say, wait, but the department down the hall has been working on that for six months or, uh, or, do we even know if the client wants this? Uh, How do you deal? I'm sure you've seen that. Do you have any thoughts about how to deal with that sort of situation? Yeah. So there's a lot of elements going on there. Um, One, I mean, it's just, it might just be simply ego, you know, like, Oh, I want to take credit for this. Mm -hmm. And I do think for team creativity to work, like the less, you know, the more you can leave ego out of the room, the better, uh, to some degree, because you this is a collaborative team approach. But I, I also think a mistake that leaders make mm-hmm. is, and, and I have made this mistake before, is not listening to the naysayers. Uh-huh. And so sometimes those naysayers, uh, or you, we might call them resistors, um, where they're, they're very resistant to the idea. And they're just like, oh, no, this is never going to work. Like, here's why, blah, blah, blah. And you might be someone that really sees potential Mm -hmm. and ignoring the naysayers has a couple of problems. One, they might be right. Right. They Mm -hmm. might actually have, maybe not a hundred percent right, but there could be something in there that you want to pay attention to. And so paying attention to those resistors or naysayers can be helpful. But the other thing is if they are fairly vocal or influential in the organization if the idea needs, um, you know, some champions throughout the organization, they can do a really good job of making sure that idea doesn't move forward. They can really uh, sabotage the idea if they Absolutely. are naysayers. And, and I will say 90% of the time, those people who, those naysayers are doing this from a place that they believe is the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. They're not doing this because they're being a jerk. They're doing this because they think, that it's not going to work and they don't want to see the organization fail. So they're doing it from a place of like protection. Mm-hmm. And so I think the best approach is bringing them in. Like, mm-hmm. let's talk. Let's like, if you could actually sit down and listen to them and maybe incorporate some ideas or um, talk through like, Oh yeah, this is a great point. Here's what I'm thinking of how we might approach that. What do you think that can I have seen situations where the naysayer has turned into like the biggest advocate for the idea and will, you know, be on stage in front of everyone and say, I was resistant at first. And then I saw how valuable this could be. Mm -hmm. And that can be really powerful. And so I think for that leader who wants to ignore the naysayer, wants to like, you know, pretend the team down the hall didn't have the idea first or whatever, you have to decide, are you in it for yourself or you are, are you in it for the success of this idea? Oh, very good question. <laughs> very good question. Hard question. Yes, yes. Really hard. And 
I just want to circle back. That goes back to what we talked about a few minutes ago, what's getting rewarded in the organization. Uh-huh. And so a lot of times teams or organizations, rather, they will reward individual behaviors, but they're saying they care about the team. So for instance, mm-hmm. people get individually promoted or individual bonuses, but then they're like, oh no, we want you all to work together as a team, but there's actually no, there's no, there's, it's, it becomes just like this verbal, this uh-huh. talk versus like, well, what's the action? How are you showing that this team's actually, that you actually care about team you know, the team's process rather than just the individual. Does that make sense? That does make sense. And actually it makes me, takes me to one, one more question, which is a lot of the people, uh, a lot of the clients who come to me are problem solvers and they tend to be people who are very good at, uh, at getting things done, solving problems before they become a problem. So they aren't noticed. And it's the, it's the loud person who has the brilliant idea, which might not actually solve the problem, but is loud about talking about, flashy about talking about that idea. They're the people who get, uh, who get rewarded. And the person who's just actually really just plugging along, doing a really good job is ignored. Uh, Any thoughts for how to break somebody out of the challenge of how, how do you show the value of things not going wrong? Mm. Oh, gosh, this this is a huge part of the work I do. So I'm I'm always interested in asking how people do this. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, uh, seeing something prevented, I mean, I just think about something like as massive as say our pandemic, if it had been prevented and never happened, like, I don't know, would we even know? Yeah. You know, like, would we even be able to give credit? Cause we wouldn't know, you know? Um, yeah. So I could, this is definitely a big challenge. I think in some ways I definitely don't have the answer or, you know, if there is even an answer, but some thoughts are, how are you showing yourself as a thought leader mm-hmm. within your organization? And how are you talking about the work that you're doing? Mm -hmm. And I think when we can start, you know, having, having ideas and talking about those thoughts and, 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 you know, thought leadership, a part of that is the leadership part. And so you can have some brilliant ideas, but they, if they don't get shared or discussed, then there's, there's not that leadership part there, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, and that can be in a lot of forms, it could be speaking, it could be, um, you know, writing, blogging, podcasting, there's all sorts of approaches for how you might do that. Um, obviously just through conversations. Mm -hmm. I do find that in a lot of cases at the end of the day, I don't know, you, you probably see this better than I do, but the person who is doing the hard work does eventually get rewarded. Um, but I think that the question I'm hearing is more like, how do you how do you see that more immediately? Yeah. How do you show yourself? How do you show up as hello? I am a thought leader. So yeah. And oh, I, Amy, oh, I could go on for hours with you. Uh, <laughs> definitely. I'm so glad to have met you and I will be following you. I would be, it would be really fun to do something together. You and I. Yeah, that would be fun. We'd we'd really have a good time. Uh, Thank you so much for being on the podcast. If, how could, what's the first thing someone could do? Having heard this and they say, okay, I'm going to take action. What's the very first thing to do? To uh, to be more creative. Ah, okay. Um, I think is to start paying attention to, I'm a big believer like that, that leadership starts with yourself. Mm-hmm. And so to start paying attention to your team and what are those dynamics within the team and specifically, how do you personally impact those dynamics? Mm. And so how are you showing up? Are you the one who an idea is brought up and you're saying, oh, no, 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 we did that in 1985 and it was a complete disaster. <laughs> 
right? We've all been there. I've made the mistake of saying, well, not exactly 1985, but I've said that before. Yeah. You know, I've, I've made the mistake of shooting down an idea. And I've also been very cognizant of being um, more open of like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. that's interesting. What do we other, other people think? Mm-hmm. And so paying attention to your own behavior and how you might be either like supporting creativity or maybe inadvertently diminishing it. Mm-hmm. So that would be a tip, okay. something simple you can do this week. Well, we will put, we will post links to your website and how people can get the climber cards and all that information in the show notes. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm really excited to talk to somebody who's really doing good things around being creative <laughs> and innovative. Well, thank you. Can I share one other little freebie for you everybody? Bet. Yes, bit? absolutely. So this actually is not necessarily related to creativity, but what we talked about at the very beginning, which was Sir Ernest Shackleton. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more about him, I have um, there's a podcast I've recorded about him and a blog post, but I also have a free a uh, little like cheat sheet download of the five top leadership skills that he exhibited that apply to us today in the modern world. Um, and you can get this at climberconsulting.com slash Shackleton. And climber is spelled C-L-I-M-E-R. No B. So, yeah, yes. no B. Yeah. <laughs> uh, climberconsulting.com slash Shackleton. So check that out if you're curious to, want to learn more. Right. I'm going to go download it right away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy Clymer, for having been on Speakers Who Get Results. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. And let me remind you, if you're curious how your presentation skills are doing, you can take our free quiz at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's speakforresultsquiz.com. And it's a four minute assessment of where your presentation skills are strong and where perhaps a little bit of support could get you the results you need and the recognition you deserve. This has been Elizabeth Bachman, Speakers Who Get Results. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.